All right, welcome back to Bloomberg News. On this Friday afternoon, I'm Matt Miller. Uh, I want to quickly wrap up uh, the top headlines for you that we've got on our top story. Alan Stanford has been indicted on what the Department of Justice is calling a $7 billion fraud, along with at least three co-workers uh, and a foreign official. Uh, the government saying in a press conference just moments ago that he lent himself $1.6 billion. Uh, he inflated the value of assets from one and a, uh, one and a quarter billion dollars in 2001 to eight and a half at the end of last year, uh, and that in at least one real estate transaction, he inflated the value of assets by six, from, from $63 million to $2 billion uh, in what they call a round-trip real estate transaction. So I have Alan Braitman here with me on set to uh, talk more about the indictment. It's actually a, a, a broad it is broad. So you know, with Madoff, people. we only got one count at the at the first uh, on the first indictment. So these were several. It's six people as well. And I know one thing that you and I were focused on and talking about with our prior guests as well is one of the people being named is Leroy King. He was a regulator in Antigua, and uh, it says in this indictment that he took bribes, that the SEC had turned to him looking for information, that it got uh, sham audits and it got phony statements. So as well, it's not just folks who work for the company they're saying, but as well kind of was a systemic problem or, or a problem with a regulator in Antigua. I, and a couple of accountants in Antigua as well? Uh, a couple of accountants for the company who have been charged with fraud, uh, Mark Kurt and Gilbert Lopez, they're scheduled to be appearing in court. Uh, as well, one of the names that we've been talking about and the name today of someone who is scheduled to appear in court next week, uh, the government officials are saying, is Laura Pendergast. Holt. Uh, she is the chief investment officer for the company. Let's remind folks, there are two cases here uh, that we've been talking about. There's the Department of Justice criminal case. There's the Security and Exchange Commission civil case. The SEC filed its suit back in February. Uh, Laura Pendergast Holt, for example, that chief investment officer, she was one of uh, the people named in that suit. And there it was an obstruction charge. It was not a criminal charge. So today now being folded into the criminal charge. And uh, also just remind folks today, the reason the SEC was here as well, not just because of their prior case, but also adding some folks to their suit today as well. All right, so a lot of charges, though, coming from the Department of Justice, uh, and these are the ones that result, that could result in jail time, obviously. Seven charges of wire fraud, I believe, ten charges of mail fraud, and then a number of different conspiracy charges uh, for Alan Stanford. And then also one thing you read a little while ago is we got the statement Important from, to keep in mind. from Stanford's lawyer. So what you had picked out the key part there that you wanted well, to read. Well, I, I, we, we, Alan had gotten a hold of a, a letter from the lawyer, and he is obviously continuing to proclaim his innocence. The lawyer said since at least February of this year, uh, Alan Stanford has been working with lawyers to meet and challenge the false accusations against him. Those accusations being that the Stanford companies were fraudulent and constituted a Ponzi scheme. To the contrary, the present insolvency of the Stanford companies was caused by the SEC heavy-handed actions which have destroyed and continue to destroy much of the value of the Stanford companies and consequently the interests of investors. So they are not only proclaiming their innocence but saying that the SEC is the reason that they have... Uh, collapsed in the, in the fund. Because originally what Stanford had been claiming was that they had $8 billion. And one thing that's being said in the indictment today, one thing also you and I have been focusing on, is not just that inflated value of real estate and, and what they're calling that round-trip transaction as well in terms of inflating the value of what they had, but also loans to Alan Stanford himself. We know he's someone who uh, lived large with his yacht, sponsoring cricket. He had been knighted uh, by the country. Uh, in Antigua. So what they're saying in the indictment, which I just opened up here, is uh, it was not disclosed in the report, they're talking about financial reports here, that approximately $4.8 billion of the purported $8 billion value of total assets was in notes on additional loans to Stanford and interest in the certain island properties, the value, they say, of which had been grossly overstated. Uh, in terms of the SEC, in terms of what you're talking about, kind of leading to the collapse, and the idea there, they're saying, is that he had this business, he had these CDs that were held for investors, and then when the SEC came out, all of that collapsed. All right, listen, let's go and talk to a legal expert on this for reaction. Uh, Peter Cook from Washington is joined by Jacob Frankel. He is a partner at the law firm Shulman Rogers and a former SEC enforcement attorney. Peter, take it away. Matt, uh, Alan, thanks very much. Jacob Frankel has been with us through the course of the day talking about this case when we first heard of, of uh, Alan Stanford's arrest uh, in Virginia. Uh, Jacob, uh, you and I were able to do a little guesswork earlier today about what might be in this indictment. Now, with the substance of it, are these fraud charges uh, based on the uh, investments, this $8 billion uh, in CDs alleged uh, by, uh, by Alan Stanford? Uh, tell me what you make, uh, what you've heard of the indictment and the charges against him. Well, the answer is yes and more. 
And to the, to the extent that the indictment is highlighting the fraud charges, we knew that was coming because those were set forth in the SEC's case, the civil case that was filed against Stanford and others. We're now seeing who else the government believes is criminally culpable. But what I find particularly interesting is the conduct of the former Antiguan government official who's been charged with bribery. That's the exact type of conduct that, that anti-bribery laws have been created hold, to prevent. Hold that thought, Jacob. We're back with Jacob Frankel after this break. And we're back here in Washington with Jacob Frankel. Uh, he's a former SEC enforcement attorney. He's now a partner at Shulman Rogers here in the D.C. area. And we're talking about Alan Stanford, the government charging Alan Stanford. You've now had a chance to review some of the indictment. Again, uh, complete your thought about your take on what's happening in this case. Well, the interesting piece that we were just discussing was the issue of bribing a foreign official. It's basically charged in the indictment as obstruction of the SEC investigation. And in essence, what you had, as we, you were all discussing before, Four was this idea of actually paying off a foreign government, government official to highlight exactly what the SEC is looking at in trying to advance its investigation. You, you know, there's a considerable initiative both in the United States and internationally to, you know, to bring a stop and mitigate this perception of widespread corruption of government officials. And here you have a case where it, the work of a government official is being designed to frustrate the work of yet another government. So I think it really highlights some of the interesting issues that are, to come, that are going to come out and come into play as this case goes forward. All right, let me ask you about some of the other players in all this. We do get indication from the government filings that uh, Mr. Davis, uh, who was the chief financial officer, Alan Stanford's former college uh, roommate, that he is going to plead in this case. That's the indication? Absolutely. He's been charged by criminal information. A criminal information, unlike an indictment, is basically a consent document. It's a document that's filed, and this, that's exactly what happened in the Madoff case, where he's, he's agreeing to plead guilty to that document. He's pleading guilty to, con to conspiracy, mail fraud, wire fraud, obstruction of the SEC's investigation. So in essence, what he's saying is the exact same thing for which you're charging Alan Stanford and that he's going to try to stand in court and defend himself. I'm Mr. Davis, the CFO, and pleading guilty. All right. Let me ask you about the statement from, uh, at least from the attorneys representing Alan Stanford. Since at least February this year, Alan Stanford has been working with lawyers to meet and challenge the false accusation against him. Those accusations being that the Stanford companies were fraudulent, constituted a Ponzi scheme. To the contrary, the present insolvency of the Stanford companies was caused by the SEC heavy-handed actions, which have destroyed and continue to destroy much of the value of the Stanford companies and consequently the interests of investors. Again, your take on the defense at this point. Well, exactly what we were discussing earlier this morning, but the, what I found very interesting about that statement it was focused on the phrase Ponzi scheme. It wasn't that he did not commit a fraud or that there wasn't a fraud here, but it's specifically describing the conduct as a Ponzi scheme, which is the language that the government sort of seized on and played on on the heels of the Bernard Madoff case. I'm not persuaded yet that this is a Ponzi scheme. It's certainly a, an indictment that reflects a massive fraud with several conspirators involved in considerable premeditated, premeditated conduct to not only defraud investors, but also to obstruct an SEC investigation, acts that can clearly be set up to establish um, indicia of money laundering. But to say it's a Ponzi scheme, there were underlying assets. Does that, does that make any difference to Alan Stanford? Does he face any less of a case because of that? There is no statute that says, you know, that, you know, the di there's no difference in the ultimate sentence if convicted if it's a Ponzi scheme or it's not a Ponzi scheme. A Ponzi scheme is charged as mail fraud and wire fraud, no different than run-of-the-mill securities fraud. The fact is the charges are the same whether it is or it isn't. I think that statement is really a deflection. It's not substance. All right. Jacob Franco, appreciate it again. Some legal perspective on the situation facing Alan Stanford charged today by the Justice Department. Matt? All right, Peter. Thanks very much.